Ethan Pitts, uh, thank you for talking with me once again. Of course, thanks for having me on. You're someone who we, we've talked a couple times on this podcast, but we've also talked a little bit uh, off the air about nuclear energy. And I know we were wanting to have a conversation in more depth, and I think now is a fitting time given the news around uh, nuclear fusion and, and how we have a net energy production and things like that. Uh, but before we get into the specifics about nuclear energy and, and the implications uh, of this energy source, where did your interest or, or passion for uh, alternative energy or, or, or nuclear energy more specifically come from? Um, that's a good question. I think my interest in nuclear energy comes from an affinity that I had growing up for, um, the 1950s and kind of the, the promise of progress and, um, and technological advancements that were coming out just in the post-war era. You know, you have, um, the, that's when nuclear energy first started to come to the forefront, um, especially in, in um, the United States and the Soviet Union, where it was, you know, there's this, all of a sudden there's this new um, energy source that has all of this potential and people were really selling it and being, you know, this is going to, we're going to be flying in space and there's going to be nuclear powered cars and it's going to be amazing. It's going to fuel all this stuff. So um, growing up, I was really interested in just that era. Um, kind of the beginning of the Cold War and nuclear energy um, was a part of that interest. And then seeing how it um, progressed through uh, the rest of the Cold War and into the modern era, you know, um, with big uh, events like Chernobyl. And I, I remember the Fukushima Daiichi plant um, explosion. I was in seventh grade <laughs> when that happened. And I remember talking about it in the, the social sciences class that we had. And so I think nuclear was always talked about tangentially and for whatever reason, I just latched onto it because it was this, you know, almost mythical source of energy to me then, you know, now I've, you know, studied a little bit about it. Granted, I'm not a nuclear physicist by any means, but um, I've delved in a bit and, you know, I'm more knowledgeable than I was before. So it's just very interesting to me. So let's dig into nuclear energy in the 21st century. Um, it was just just yesterday that I was watching a, uh, a YouTube video of Carl Sagan. It was from 1985, and he was testifying before Congress about climate change. And even then, he made these, albeit quick appeals to nuclear energy, both fission and fusion, um, and it's interesting because although he's a really great speaker, more or less his points seem to be the same points I'm hearing today, almost 40 years later. So why, A, why are we as a society or maybe just as, as an individual, why are we interested and why are you interested in nuclear energy? And B, why has the conversation seemingly remained stagnant for 40 years? Yeah, so um, I think there's, there's a lot of factors that go into why the conversation has stagnated and, I mean, even stalled and maybe regressed in some aspects. Um, I think that, right, the, um, the Cold War and nuclear weapons and public perception about nuclear weapons um, has was a big part of that, um, kind of a false equivalence between nuclear energy research and nuclear weapons research. They do, there is a relationship there, but um, re the research produces very two different effects, either weapons or, um, or energy sources. Um, I think the nuclear disasters, right? I mean, Carl Sagan speaking in 1985, the following year in 86 is when Chernobyl um, exploded and released an immense amount of radiation. And then, um, you know, there's been a couple other ones, but the most recent one was the Fukushima Daiichi plant, um, which kind of weaned the entire country of Japan off of nuclear energy <laughs> and everything like that. Um, so I think that public perception is a big, a big deal there. Um, I would say also that the 
kind of the oil shocks of the late 1970s with OPEC cutting down oil production um, and kind of hamstringing the U.S. energy economy uh, brought fossil fuels really back into the mainstream and saying, hey, nuclear energy is great and all, but our cars run on fossil fuels right now. Our system is built to run on fossil fuels right now. And it's expensive, so we need to pour our money and resources into producing it domestically or at least within um, an economic system that has some separation from OPEC and kind of some oil cartels there. So I think those are the biggest reasons why. Um, I do think it's interesting. So uh, Germany uh, has been, up until the Russian invasion of Ukraine, interestingly enough, Germany was... Um, slated to dismantle all of its nuclear energy plants, completely just get rid of them and invest in other um, kind of renewable energy sources like wind and solar, hydroelectric and stuff like that, and um, kind of cleaner fossil fuels, um, more advanced technologies there. Um, but ever since there's been the threat of, you know, Russian oil exports going down and the jeopardy to German, but also European energy security as a whole, um, the German parliament has started to revisit that decision and has kind of left the door open for, hey, you know what? <laughs> we should probably start looking at nuclear again as a viable solution. So, yeah. How, how recent is this revisiting? Um, it's this year. I believe it's in the summer. Okay, so this is, this is new, uh, new decision making. Exactly. So I guess this was in summer 2022. We're in 2023 now. <laughs> So why does the conversation in your mind actually matter? Because in today's world, you know, especially ever since Tesla's taken off, uh, but in today's world, everyone hears about electricity, you know, electric cars, solar power, uh, wind turbines, hydroelectric dams. Um, I, I saw a statistic just this morning that over 5% of cars purchased last year were electric cars, I think more than uh, the 3% the year prior. So clearly, clearly a trend happening here. Uh, in that world where we seem to have solutions, why does this conversation around nuclear energy, be it fusion or fission, and we can get into the specifics of what the differences are, um, but what, why does this conversation matter in your mind? So... We have to understand how the energy system works and everything. So you've got a certain amount of energy that you have to pr produce, that energy companies and providers have to produce um, to their customers, right? So, uh, and that, that's going to vary throughout the day, throughout the time of year and everything. Um, and right now, renewable energies, uh, solar energy and wind energy and hydroelectric energy, um, cannot provide what's called a base level of energy um, production, right? Because if it's cloudy outside, solar energy is not going to work. If the wind's not going, then wind power is not going to go. Hydroelectric um, is reliant on water, right? And so if there's some kind of uh, disaster or just a lull where those energies do not are not operating at the production levels or the efficiency levels that they need to, then there's going to be a drag on, on the energy system. And so um, even in, or in countries where ener renewable and um, kind of clean energy sources are being used and implemented, it, you see this a lot in kind of Western Europe and Northwestern Europe, um, they're still using fossil fuels or nuclear, right? France, the majority of their electricity is produced by nuclear because what they're doing with the nuclear or in the fossil fuels, um, what that is doing is it's presiding or it's providing the bulk level, right? That it's going to produce a certain amount that is always going to be there, no matter what. And at upticks, you can start pulling from other sources, or you can ramp up the base level to to do that. So for the needs of a large energy grid, you know, be it a city or a state, up to an entire country. Uh, you need a, a, um, an energy source that will produce consistently high amounts of energy, and that's produced uh, mainly by fossil fuels or by nuclear. So the other sources of energy don't have the capacity right now, you know, maybe in the future, but right now they don't have the capacity to do that. 
What role do you think uh, batteries play in this? Because I've, I've heard the argument that uh, uh, regardless of whether or not nuclear could be beneficial, if you just have a large enough battery storage uh, from your solar panels that on a cloudy day we have battery storage, when the wind's not blowing we have battery storage, uh, is that a good argument or are there other factors here about, let's say, lithium production or, or cost or something like that? Yeah, so, I mean, that's definitely a valid thing to be talking about with batteries, you know, obviously storing power for future use, um, but then you run into a whole other slew of issues, like you said, like lithium mining and stuff like that. Um, is environmentally taxing, and then it would be astronomically expensive to build enough batteries to support a base level production or energy production that um, a large energy grid would require. Would require. That makes sense. Okay, so let's, without further ado, let's dig into nuclear energy then. Nuclear fission, if I have this right, is the big reactors everyone knows and loves or loves to hate. Um, explain, let's just start with how does that work? What is actually going on that's creating energy? Because it all, it's kind of hard to understand. You can see the sun, oh, the photons are hitting some panel that's absorbing it, or the wind spinning a turbine. That's that's intuitive to a lot of people. But what is happening behind these large beaker-shaped concrete walls that's actually creating energy for us to use? Yeah. So um, to start off right there, those those um, those big towers that you see, those are cooling towers and that's le le leaving off all of the steam um, that's generated. Um, so fossil fuel, the actual core of the energy production that's producing the electricity that comes out of the, the you know, sockets that we use, um, that, that is produced both by fossil fuels and nuclear. They produce it the same way. Um, by generating steam that turns a turbine. And that spinning turbine um, generates the electricity. And so the big difference between fossil fuels and nuclear energy is how you generate that steam, how you heat the water up to the point where it boils and gives off steam. Um, so fission is the, um, the only form of commercial nuclear power that we have. Um, it's the only way that we've been able to generate um, electricity from. Um, fusion is completely in its experimental and um, theoretical stages right now. So fission is what we're working with. Um, fission works um, where there's kind of five components that go into to fission. So everything is within uh, a containment structure. Um, and that's usually a building that has a housing that's shielded from radiation and everything happens within that reactor that's shielded, and that's housed within a building. Um, inside that reactor, you have fuel rods, and those fuel rods um, are made up of uranium or plutonium. Um, uranium-235, it's an isotope of uranium, is the most common fuel, but we also use plutonium-239 as well. Um, and so the fuel rods are in the reactor, there's moderators that are in the reactor, and that can be um, graphite rods that go in, and basically the moderators are there to um, slow down neutrons that are generated from fission reactions. Um, and then there are also um, control rods that um, have neutron-absorbing materials. That control rods, you can change how much is in the reactor at a given time, so you can withdraw them and increase the reaction, or you can slowly um, insert them back into the reactor and slow the reaction. Um, and then there's coolant, and that's typically water, and the coolant um, cools the reactor, but it also is heated to produce steam um, at certain parts of the, of the actual uh, power plant. So fission works by um, you're breaking apart a nucleus of, um, of uranium or plutonium, right? And with that breaking of the nucleus, um, releases these neutrons um, and an immense amount of energy. And so that's what allows the um, reaction to continue. And so it's these shattering of nuclei that creates the energy, which is released in heat, that then um, heats the coolant and um, generates the steam. So that's how fission works very simplistically. 
what's causing the nuclei to actually break? Is it a natural process, some kind of radioactive decay, or are we causing it to break? Like, how is it actually initiating this first step of breaking apart to release energy? Yeah, so the nuclear reactors are designed in a certain way to bring out that natural process um, where the uranium molecules are smashing into each other or and then it's giving stuff off like that. And so um, it's creating the conditions um, inside the reactor that allows um, that process to occur. Okay, uh, so that makes sense. So now tell me why is this considered clean energy or tell me if it's not because i hear a lot that people will mention clean energy sources they'll say yeah solar wind nuclear but i don't think about there ever being nuclear you know like any kind of waste when i think about a solar farm somewhere right so why is nuclear energy considered a clean energy uh and and how is that different from, from the other clean energies yeah so Nuclear energy, I wouldn't call it a, you know, a strictly clean energy and have like put a big green leaf on it when you talk about it and everything like that. I think that all energy sources have um, hidden environmental costs, um, you know, that are trade offs there. Right. So I talked about how uranium and plutonium are used as fuel, but we have to get that. And where do you get that? You get it by going into a mine and digging it out of the earth. Right. And as part of the mining process, there's radioactive tailings that are produced. Um, you know, water can be contaminated, soil contamination. There's all sorts of things that can be environmentally damaging as part of just extracting the fuel and everything. So we're not even to nuclear generation yet. But just getting the uranium or plutonium out of the ground can be um, pretty devastating to the, the environment. Um, now, there's a lot of government regulation and it's highly controlled. Um, and so that can be pretty much mitigated through, you know, um, taking proper precautions of, of where we're mining and, you know, surveying the landscape, making sure that we're not polluting water tables and stuff like that. Um, there's always risks there, but, um, for the most part, we're pretty good at getting uranium out of the ground safely and disposing of the waste safely. Um, but then of course, when you get into nuclear power generation, um, fuel by definition expires at a certain spot, you know, you're, you're going to run out of fuel at some point. So generally about, about a third of a reactor's fuel load is, um, exchanged every year to two years on average. And so that's where we're taking out these spent fuel rods, which are still highly radioactive, right? The half-life or the radioactive decay of um, uranium and plutonium can run into the thousands of years, right? So way beyond lifetime and who knows, even past civilization, whatever. <laughs> um, so for the first, um, generally, uh, what happens is for the first 10 to 20 years, those are kept in um, places called spent fuel pools, which are just giant pools of water because water is a moderator. Um, and it can absorb and slow down the, um, the neutrons that are flying around. Um, and they just sit there for a little bit, you know, well, 20, 10 to 20 years is not quite a little bit, but they're there, right? Um, these spent fuel pools are on site for the most part at nuclear reactors because they're designed with the specific fuel that the reactor was built for in mind. So that as soon as it, gets out of the reactor, they just move it over and plop it into the pool and, and let it kind of cool down. The water also cools the, the fuel rods because once you take them out, they're still really hot and they're, they stay hot for years. Uh, and then when, when you're done with that, um, you can, you take it out and you can put it in dry cast storage. Um, and what that is, is just, you know, um, the fuel rods are placed inside casks that have um, radiation buffers and um, shielding on them uh, and then those are those can be housed in you know special containment buildings either on the surface of uh, the planet or deep within it um, and so that's how you kind of handle the high level nuclear waste that's generated from nuclear reactors 
So nuclear waste is part of its uh, bad PR, and, and admittedly, nuclear fission does need a new PR team. But there's also the uh, vestigial bad PR, if you will, of nuclear meltdowns. What is a meltdown? What is melting? What is exploding? What is uh, what is overheating? Like what's actually happening in there that is so destructive? and makes people so nervous about living near or anywhere near a nuclear power plant. Yeah. So meltdown certainly is a, is a scary word that conjures up a lot of images. And, you know, we've got TV shows and a whole slew of media that portray it. Um, so what a meltdown is, is it's a process where, uh, the nuclear reaction inside of a reactor gets out of control and generates heats that um, that the reactor is not designed to withstand. And at that point, the reactor itself begins to melt. And so fuel rods melt, control rods melt, um, you know, the shielding and the buffers that kind of keep everything contained can also melt. Um, so in, you know, the example that probably everyone's thinking about is Chernobyl, uh, what happened there, right? So Chernobyl was um, a nuclear accident that happened during a test. Um, and the operators at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which is in Ukraine, but um, it was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic at that point, so in the Soviet Union, they were running a test to determine how long the turbine Right, the turbine that generates the electricity, how long the turbine itself would spin after the reactor was kind of powered down um, so that it would still provide power to the coolant pumps that keep the reactor cool. And through um, operator error, a lack of safety culture, and um, some pretty critical design flaws within the reactor itself, um, what happened was the um, reactor kind of went wild. And by the time that the operators realized anything was going on, um, the pressure and heat inside of the reactor was so much that it blew the top of the containment chamber off. And so the initial damage that's caused by Chernobyl, like the building exploding, um, that wasn't a nuclear explosion. It wasn't anything like that. It was a steam explosion that the water inside the reactor was superheated so much that it lifted the multi-ton steel door straight off and blew the roof off of the building um but the heat itself was so much that eventually the actual reactor and all the fuel rods and everything started to melt and kind of melt into a giant mass of um, material that's called corium which is just it's only found in nuclear reactors because it's basically everything in a nuclear reactor melted into one it's just this gigantic radioactive molten sludge um and that's where all of the radiation in Chernobyl came from, was the fire that was burning inside of the reactor and was just spewing all of the radiation into the air and into the atmosphere. Um, the same thing happened in Fukushima, um, where right there was a magnitude 9 earthquake that struck off the coast of Japan. Um, the earthquake knocked, off, knocked out the power to the facility, um, of course, all nuclear facilities have backup generators and everything. So the diesel generators powered on to make sure that the coolant pumps to the nuclear reactors stayed operational. Um, but Fukushima was built right on the coast and the tsunami that came from the earthquake um, overpowered the safety walls that were built for that power plant and ended up flooding the lower levels of that facility, bogging down the diesel generators, knocking those offline. And so then the reactor is not getting coolant and it just heats up and heats up and heats up and um, the pressure gets so much and there's hydrogen explosions inside the reactor that cause damage to the reactor and then it starts to melt down as well. So that's what a meltdown is. And how long is an area inhabitable, at least to humans and maybe to other animals, after a meltdown? Is this... Uh... A 20-year timeline? Is this a thousand-year timeline due to their half-life? Like, what does this look like? Uh, it really depends on the, like, how, like, what kind of fuel is in the reactor, um, how much of it is released into the environment, um, and in what way, right? So, 
um, a big concern with Chernobyl at, was that the radiation w- or the the corium, um, the melted reactor sludge, would melt through the foundation of the actual the entire plant, the concrete base, and everything. And if it did that, then it would have potentially contaminated the entire water table, um, and right that would have rendered a enormously huge region of Europe uninhabitable. Um, the immediate area, um, well, that, that actually ne- that never happened because the Soviets had a heat exchanger that cooled it down <laughs> sufficiently so that it wouldn't melt through the concrete base. Um, so the area around Chernobyl now um, is not inhabited. Um, there's right there they evacuated Pripyat, which was the town um, neighboring Chernobyl, um, and people haven't really returned there. Right, you can you can go to Pripyat on tours. Probably not right now, given the war. But right, I mean, when the war started, there were Russian troops in Chernobyl, and scientists in Chernobyl, and there's always been people there. Um, so it just it depends on where the radiation is and how intense it is. Um, so you you can go to a lot of these places um, still for a short amount of time, you know, a couple of days maybe, um, as long as you're taking precautions. Um, but if it's a really bad situation and right, they weren't able to put a containment vessel over the top of Chernobyl, then it could be uninhabitable for, you know, hundreds of years, probably. I noticed just recently that as the years have gone by, the price of nuclear energy, specifically nuclear fission has gone up. Uh, And I can only assume that's because of its bad PR and, and, maybe the reduction of power plants. Uh, do you see that as a sign that the public, the general public is not going to get on board in time, that we end up actually shutting down nuclear energy? Or is that, in your eyes, more of a, an American issue that actually doesn't exist in other places? Well, I think, right, we have to look at the costs, like where that rising cost is coming from, right? So nuclear energy is um, requires a pretty substantial upfront investment of capital and resources and all sorts of stuff there. Construction costs are high. Um, regulations and safety requirements are really strict in this country and elsewhere, which increase the operating costs at nuclear power plants. Decommissioning power plants is expensive because you have to handle all the radioactive stuff and make sure everything's handled good. Um, other energy sources becoming more affordable um, makes nuclear energy um, or can make nuclear energy become less attractive. And so people aren't going to be investing in it and the money kind of dries up, which means that it make costs more to maintain and do all this other stuff when people aren't focusing on it. Um, and I think public perception definitely um, makes it more difficult to secure that funding and investment, um, which just makes it more expensive. Um, to go. So, um, but I think it's important to note that, um, you know, there are are other countries that are, that are focusing a lot on nuclear. So we, we haven't really given up on our nuclear power. Um, There was a huge lull of a couple decades where we didn't approve any more nuclear power plants or anything, but but I believe it was last year where the U S government was approving nuclear power plants in Wyoming and kind of new nuclear energy sources there. Um, and so the governments um, typically come in. Uh, it's not usually a private endeavor, a sole private endeavor. The government typically um, comes in and helps out with these. And so it's seen kind of as a public funds use case as well. So, um, yeah, I think that answered the question there. Yeah, so so nuclear seems to be to be hanging on this or maybe on a pendulum, you know, uh, ups and downs based on uh, recent or semi-recent history, you know, for meltdowns and things like that versus public subsidies from the government. And that also swings it the other way, right? But I've never heard anything really bad about nuclear fusion. Uh, And since uh, the recent news, I don't know, was it a month ago, that at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, there was this net energy creation that we actually came out with more energy than we started with in nuclear fusion. Um, So let's start there. What is 
nuclear fusion and how is this energy created? Yeah, so nuclear fusion is kind of the opposite of nuclear fission, right? Where nuclear fission, you're splitting uh, these atoms apart. Um, with fusion is you're fusing nuclei together to create a larger one. So um, we look at what happened at Lawrence Livermore at the National Ignition Facility, um, which was built specifically for this purpose. Um, right, you had a, it produced, I think it was like 3.5 or 3.15 megajoules of energy where they only put in 2.05. Um, and so it produced energy. So we see that, okay, this, this is a, this is real world evidence of a, of a fusion reaction that's generating more energy than what is being put in. And that's historic because, you know, for decades we've been, you know, on paper, it should work, you know, everybody's doing all the calculations and it should all turn out to do that. And this is kind of the first big hard evidence that we found of this happening. So, um, what this is, so there's two, um, isotopes of hydrogen that are used in for our current research on fusion and that's deuterium and tritium and um, those are just isotopes of hydrogen um, which means what exactly yeah so the isotope of hydrogen um, an isotope is a variation of um, an element um, and so it's, it's a different form uh, so there's different number of neutrons in their nuclei um, they have the same number of protons inside, but the, the actual neutrons change. And so it's, yeah, so deuterium is, um, is one of them. And then tritium is the other one. Uh, well, there's more, but those are the, those are the, the core ones for, for fusion as we're concerned. Um, deuterium is, um, also called like heavy hydrogen. Um, it's also heavy water uh it's called that just because um it has um it has properties that water doesn't uh it's slightly different right it boils at a slightly higher temperature and stuff like that um tritium has um similar properties uh they're they're used in other applications as well so both of them are used in thermonuclear weapons um, which has a, a little element of fusion in them, which we can talk about if you'd like. Um, but tritium is also used in nuclear medicine. Um, so it emits beta particles that are easily detected. Um, it's also used in lighting, like self-powered lighting. So if you have a glow-in-the-dark watch, it's probably tritium. Um, exit signs use tritium. Gun sites uh, use tritium as well. So those are real-world applications where you don't have to worry about you know, harmful ionizing radiation. Um, it's used in chemistry, biology, um, same thing with deuterium, used in thermonuclear weapons. It's used as a neutron moderator. So D2O instead of H2O, D2O is heavy water, um, and some reactors use heavy water as a moderator. Um, and then it's also used in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So that's a medical application for it. Um, and so basically what you have in a fusion reaction is you are creating an environment where deuterium and tritium are there and the heat and the pressure is so great that it forces those um, nuclei to come together to cross a barrier um, and fuse into a new um, a new isotope which is called helium-4 and in that, that process a high energy neutron is shot off and so you have helium-4 which remains and that neutron shoots off and that's where um, the, the reaction continues and all of that heat and pressure builds and builds and builds and it forces everything to come back together. And that's where, that's how you get fusion. Um, there are two ways of, well, there's two main ways that I'm aware of that, um, we can achieve those conditions. Um, the first, um, one, which is the most common one, um, it's something called a tokamak and a tokamak is, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's like a it's like a ringed donut. Okay, so it's a device. Um, it's tokamak is an acronym um, in Russian. It it was developed in the Soviet Union. Um, it, it's 
um, Russian language acronym for toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. And so it's a, it's just a ringed donut that goes around and it has magnets and that generate a magnetic, a strong, strong, strong magnetic field uh, inside the device. And inside the device, you have that deuterium and tritium, which is superheated to plasma with the, the fourth state of matter there. Um, and it can, I mean, it can go up to like 16 or 150 million degrees Celsius, and it's 10 times hotter than the sun's center. Um, and so obviously you don't want that touching the edges of the of the containment device because that wouldn't be good for us. <laughs> so the magnets are, are keeping it from touching anything. Yes. So the magnetic fields are strong enough that you're forcing that plasma into that donut shape. Um, that's kind of suspended in, in space there. And the magnets are forcing it together, which is creating the, the pressure um, and the heat is generated, obviously, from the plasma there that creates that, um, that reaction, that fusion reaction. So the joint European Taurus is um, a tokamak device. It's the largest in the world. Um, it's the most sophisticated um, it holds the record for fusion output, um, 59 megajoules over five seconds. So a lot, lot more energy there, um, but right, not as much, or it's it, it's not as, um, it's not like what, what happened in Lawrence Livermore, because Lawrence Livermore uses entirely different technology. Um, so a tokamak is, um, is something... That's called a uh, it well it creates and sustains what's called a magnetically contained fusion reaction. Whereas what happened at Lawrence Livermore was um, an inertial contained or inertia contained fusion reaction. So the device and the scaling and everything is entirely different. So moving to Lawrence Livermore, um, what you have is something called a whole realm, which I'm going to hold up my headphones case here which you know is not going to translate translate well into audio space you know an airpods case or a pill or something like that it's just gonna it's it's cooled and it holds inside of it the the fusion fuel and that's going to be the same deuterium and tritium that's inside of it um it's kind of suspended like this um and it's cooled off it's super cooled and essentially what they did was they fired um high-powered lasers from the top and the bottom. So imagine two cones, one cone shooting into the bottom of the capsule and one shooting into the top of the capsule. So cone, cone. Um, and those hit the capsule, um, the whole realm, and that creates an emission of X-rays. And the X-rays um, then go on to create the heat and the pressure um, that creates that fusion reaction. And so that is the difference between the two, um, the two forms of nuclear fusion. So fusion then is the energy that's being created, that's being used heat energy. Yeah. So, um, the majority of the energy is emitted through light, uh, at least in the inertial um, fusion or inertial contained fusion, but there is a substantial, an enormous amount of heat that is harnessed through a heat exchanger, and then that through that heat exchanger, it's used to um, generate steam. So ultimately, we're back to the same mechanism then of spinning a turbine. A turbine, if I hear you right. Exactly. So uh, I think most people, including myself, when they hear this description of a large donut shape with particles spinning, going through the middle of it that let's say collide and, and, and fuse or explode. Um, I picture something like the large Hadron Collider that people who have watched the Big Bang Theory uh, would know about. Is that a similar mechanism? Is, is this large Hadron Collider a type of fusion reactor or are these totally different mechanisms? Those are totally different. The Large Hadron Collider, um, as far as I'm aware, um, I mean, it's substantially longer and greater in size, right? So the, the, uh, um, the jet in England, which is the big 
um, tokamak or sorry, tokamak um, d device that is substantially smaller. It's still massive, but it's not. It doesn't take nearly as uh, much real estate as the hadron collider. And what the hadron collider, I believe, what, what it's doing is it's speeding up um, a molecule or an atom fast enough in efforts to break it um, into a smaller one. So that's you know. If we're talking in nuclear terms, that's fission. You're smashing it um, apart, but it's not designed to do that with the intent of creating um, energy. I see. So uh, you mention thermonuclear weaponry and how they could have these um, similar uh, fusion reactions happening, maybe on a smaller scale. Um, that rings the same alarm bells in my brain as hearing, oh, uh, you know, nuclear warheads f as a result of nuclear uh, fission. Like, w it all hits the same alarm bells in my mind. So uh, is this actually any safer or any cleaner than than classic understanding of these large nuclear um, uh, reactors? Or is it simply promoted as the next best thing, not because it's safer per se, but because it has the potential for this net positive gain in energy that is much more, you know, long-term sustainable or something like that. Yeah. Um, so let's take a little sidebar here and uh, kind of delve into nuclear weapons. So the there's there's two forms of nuclear um, or weaponry that uses nuclear reactions. The first is are their nuclear weapons, also known as atomic bombs. And those are the only nuclear weapons that have ever been used, and we don't rely on them anymore. So the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan um, were nuclear weapons. And those relied solely on fission. Uh, it was a fission reaction. Uh, the different bombs had different designs, um, but essentially, in essence, what you're doing is you're uh, you have uranium or plutonium that's contained inside of a space, and it's surrounded by explosives, um, and the explosives ex um, generate enough energy to force the uranium together, um, which the smashing of them together um, creates the fission reaction, which generates and releases that enormous amount of um, of energy and destructive power. Um, so we don't really make those anymore. Uh, the the backbone of basically every country's nuclear arsenal is um, what are called thermonuclear weapons or hydrogen bombs. And what these are is um, they work a little different. So um, hydrogen bombs are two-stage weapons. The first stage is a fission reaction. And so... Um, Right, you have the same process where a fission reaction is generated, and that fission reaction is then harnessed into stage two, where it compresses and heats. So it generates that intense pressure and intense heat um, that um, causes deuterium and tritium to launch into an uncontrolled fusion reaction that releases an extraordinary amount of heat and light through thermonuclear fusion. Right? So uh, thermonuclear fusion um, in a weapon sense is way more destructive than a fission reaction, um, just the regular nuclear fission. Um, fusion reactors are using thermonuclear fusion as well. However, nuclear reactors and thermonuclear weapons are designed um, entirely differently, right? So the whole point of a thermonuclear weapon is you want to create an uncontrollable fusion reaction that, you know, is going to keep going until it runs out of fuel immediately. Um, whereas a fusion reactor is built from the ground up to control that reaction. And that's done by how much, how much deuterium and tritium is fed into the reactor, right? Um, how much like you can switch off the the lasers you can switch off the magnetic fields you can cool it down you can do all this other stuff so that um you know you're not going to see the kind of fusion or the kind of explosions that you would see with a thermonuclear weapon 
Uh, is the lack of uh, explosions, the lack of meltdowns, to use the old language, um, is that because we have more advanced technology and fusion is a newer technology and we're better at controlling it? Or is that something inherent with how nuclear fusion by design and, and naturally occurring um, is taking place? Is that something that's actually safer or is this just our perception of safety because we have better regulation and things like that? No, that I would say that that's inherent in the design of it. Um, so, fusion research really kicked off in the 1950s in the Soviet Union. Um, they started building the tokamak devices. Uh, it's built by a guy named Andrei Sakharov, um, who's kind of the seen as the grandfather of the Soviet nuclear weapons program, um, but also later was um, a Soviet dissident and all that good stuff, kind of like Oppenheimer was here. Um, and so fusion research, um, research into energy produced by fusion um, has um, always been um, safer than than the alternatives. It's just that you have to create an environment um, of intense heat and intense pressure that we just haven't really been able to do until relatively recently, right? I mean, there's been tokamak devices that were built in the 50s and then uh, in the Soviet Union, and then that was kind of exported um, into other countries as well. And so basically a bunch of different countries were building research devices based on the tokamak design um, to experiment with fusion and see see what it is there and, and everything. So, right, going back to nuclear waste, um, heat, so the problem with nuclear waste um, and what makes radiation dangerous is ionizing radiation. And what ionizing radiation is, is it's radiation that has enough, um, so it's electro, radiation is electromagnetic waves or particles. Um, and right, so the light that is being cast on me right now, that's radiation. Um, that's visible light that's in the spectrum there. Um, but it doesn't have enough energy to remove electrons from the atoms and molecules that make me up. Um, if it did, then that would be ionizing radiation and it would be harmful to me, obviously. So um, fission reactions um, create that, um, that ionizing radiation and that's anything from gamma rays to X-rays, um, UV light, alpha particles, beta particles, um, and neutrons and stuff like that. Um, so fusion reactions do not produce ionizing radiation. Um, the main product of a fusion reaction is that um, helium-4 helium isotope, which is non-radioactive, non-toxic, and it's a chemically inert gas. So you don't have the same issues with fusion that you do with fission. You, you're not going to wind up with a giant pool filled with, you know, superheated radioactive fuel rods or anything in a, in a fusion reactor. So it's definitely, I would say it definitely promises to be more safe than the traditional nuclear reactors than we've been using thus far. When I've looked into this on my own time, uh, as you said, there's deuterium and tritium isotopes uh, at play here in different, different machines. Uh, but tritium, from my understanding, is actually radioactive. So is the is the absence of a problem there just because it's used in such uh, small amounts or because it doesn't have quite a, as long of a half-life as something like uranium or plutonium? Or, or why is that version of radioactivity not as dangerous? Because to me, I just see, oh, that's radioactive, plutonium's radioactive. And, and you say light is also radioactive, but is this uh, tritium just on a scale that's not going to be damaging? Or, or what, what's the difference there? Yeah, so that, that's exactly right. I'm not sure what the half-life of tritium is um, and if tritium is producing um, um, ionizing radiation. I don't know that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, right, but half-lives can go anywhere from less than a second to hundreds of thousands of years and everything. So the half-life where it would be um, dangerous could be, you know, faster than the blink of an eye, you know, where it wouldn't have any any kind of effect on you and right i mean it's mm -hmm. it's use 
tritium is used in um, applications like exit signs and watch faces and stuff like that. So um, I don't know off the top of my head, but my gut reaction would be that it's not producing that kind of, on its own, it's not producing that kind of radiation. Mm -hmm. Do we have, uh, do you know, do we have enough of these isotopes or are we creating them on our own? Are we finding them in nature? Because when I think about hydrogen, right? You don't just often jump into a lake and it's heavy water. Oh, it's it's D2O. That doesn't really happen, right? You're not just going to a special lake somewhere. Um, so is that just a, a misunderstanding on my part because it's actually you know one part per thousand in every in every pool of water is actually uh, this isotope, or is it something that that we're creating in our own and that takes a level of energy? Yeah. So um, deuterium, I know. Um, is definitely it, it is naturally occurring as well. Mm -hmm. You can you can make it. You can make deuterium and tritium, um, right? You're just changing the um, the neutrons on there, um, and I, I I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's like 156 deuterium to every thousand hydrogen atoms um, and everything. So I could be off on that, but so deuterium. Um, does occur naturally, and I'm pretty sure tritium does as well. Um, mm -hmm. But you can make it, and extracting it is as easy. You can distill water, um, and and you can get deuterium from that um, as well. So um, we're we're using we're using hydrogen and uh, isotopes of hydrogen because hydrogen is um, readily available and very abundant in our natural environment, and so. Uh, and the atomic numbers are low enough that the barrier through which you would have to force the atoms to cross in order to fuse um, is much lower than if you were to do it with a um, a different element. Okay, so uh, comparing nuclear fission and fusion, it's clear what the challenges are moving forward with nuclear fission. You know, from from bad PR to the potential for meltdowns, whether it's from poor design or, or, or human error. But what are the challenges you see in the future for, for nuclear fusion? Um, I think definitely the biggest challenge is, um, or the biggest barrier to nuclear fusion right now is um, knowledge and resources, where we just we have to be able to create and sustain it the, that reaction long enough um, so that we can consistently and reliably um, harness the energy to produce electricity. Um, right? We're still. I mean, we've been researching fusion for you know decades, but we're still not at a point where we are able to say, hey, you know what? F flip on the fusion reactor and you know, let's see if we can power the building or power this light bulb or something like that, right? Um, I mean, the the tokamak device in England produced energy over five seconds, right? So we we just have to be able to build facilities um, and uh, gain enough understanding of the reactions there uh, to to make fusion a viable uh to make it viable commercially do you ever see a world where nuclear fusion or fission is seen in our day-to-day -day life not simply used as a big generator that adds energy to the grid but let's say it's a car engine right i mean you'll see nuclear power i i assume it's uh a nuclear fission in something like a, a super carrier, like a large aircraft carrier. But outside of something at that scale, you don't ever just say, oh, you know, do you have a V6 or a V8? Oh, no, I have a, I have a nuclear fusion uh, engine in my car, right? That's not a thing you see. And, and maybe that sounds crazy to talk about. But is that something that just in terms of the physics of it all, you think is even possible? Or is this something that because of the high levels of heat, and because of the energy and, and the requirements for these high levels of uh, electromagnetism, that this can only be done on a large scale, and really we just need to beef up the grid to handle it? Um, I definitely think that 
I have a hard time seeing um, a future where you have an electric car powered by a nuclear reactor, um, like even in the next hundred years or two hundred years, right? But that's I'm just spitballing there, <laughs> um, just because I mean we're still in very very early stages of it. I'm not I don't want to preclude anything, um, you know, but the the national Ig- ignition facility at Lawrence Livermore is a massive facility where you're they generate lasers in a special compound and those are sent through the facilities and there's all sorts of fiber optic cables bending them and moving them around and magnifying them and they go through amplifiers that amplify them by like 16 billion times their energy and then they're all shown onto a specific little tiny little capsule right there um and the footprint of that plan is or that plant is enormous and i have a hard time seeing how um in the near future or even the you know next couple decades how we would be able to shrink that down but that being said right uh we're not the only ones researching fusion reactors right you've got we've got us with uh or the u.s with our um our national laboratories and pouring government funds into it Uh, The Chinese have been looking at fusion reactors of their own and the Europeans as well. So, you know, there is kind of competition in the space between these different governments. Um, And I think that um, I think that fusion is definitely a technology that the United States and other uh, major world uh, powers will continue will to continue to heavily invest in at least researching. Um, so the Department of Energy holds uh, control over um, the nuclear facilities, um, but there's also something called the National Nuclear Safety Administration or Nuclear Security um, Administration. And so what that is, is uh, it works with, um, it has a lot of different functions, but it particularly, particularly in this field, Uh, It worked at the National Ignition Facility on this experiment and on on the the research there. Um, The the deputy director of the NS or the NNSA gave a little press conference where he explained exactly what happened um, pretty succinctly. He did it like in a minute and a half, (laughs) way better than I could because he just knows the stuff super well. Um, But he explained that there are national security implications, right? So what's the Defense Department? What's the what's the national nuclear security administration? Like what, what is this and everything? And so there are, um, you know, national defense interests that are in fusion. Um, and it doesn't have to do with, you know, nuclear explosions necessarily or anything. And so he listed three of them off. I wrote them down here. Um, so number one is that these laboratory experiments, um, that are generated by by research, um, help, defense programs um, continue to maintain confidence in deterrent um, and the United States um, nuclear deterrent capability without the need of nuclear explosive testings. Uh, So back in the 70s and 80s, there was a series of comprehensive nuclear test ban treaties where uh, in the 40s, 50s and 60s, and uh, we would explode bombs in the air, on the ground, under the ocean to test them to see, you know, exactly what's going on here. Um, and after a couple decades of that, we decided, you know, we came together with the Soviets and decided, you know what, we probably should limit this <laughs> and, and get it down. And so it started with limiting atmospheric testing that was banned, you know, and then underwater testing that was banned. And now it's um, pretty much across the board that you're not supposed to be testing nuclear weapons. Um, which is why North Korea's nuclear tests underground are so important because um, most of the world adheres to those, those um, standards. Uh, The second point that he mentioned for national security is that this experiment underpins the credibility of us nuclear deterrent by demonstrating world leading expertise in weapons, relevant technologies. Uh, The third point is continuing to assure our allies that we know what we're doing in the nuclear world. um, And, Uh, It allows us to continue to avoid nuclear testing, um, and that advances um, the United States' own uh, nuclear non-proliferation goals. So 
I think just for the fact that nuclear research into nuclear topics um, has in some ways kind of national security implications, I think that we will continue to research them. And right, I mean, think about how many technologies have come out of military uses, right? I mean, the internet and everything that have has just completely supercharged our economy and societies and everything has come out of out of stuff like that. Um, but I think that at least that, even if the commercial aspects kind of go away and people are just like, you know what, this is too much time, too much money. I think that it, we will continue to um, research how to harness energy from nuclear fusion into the future. Well, on the topic of national security, I know you're someone who keeps up with a lot of current events, global affairs, things like that. I, I was uh, listening to a podcast today. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember who who it was and they laid out a roadmap uh, quite uh, quite a scary roadmap to a future where nuclear weaponry uh, is used by Russia and the argument was that if Russia uh, as they lose Ukraine if there is an offensive let's say Ukraine is defended Russia is down on, on, on its troops um, as they tend to use uh, humans pretty pretty use uh, pretty loosely in warfare right they, they're more or less disposable to a certain extent uh, that if there was a, a an offensive that occurred later and Russia was backed into a corner that uh, what do you have to lose at that point if you're going to lose your national identity you have this ability to to launch uh, nuclear weaponry. Uh, do you see that there is any uh, possibility in that? Because I, I hear this from people and I don't know who to trust. And you're someone who I know just stays up on these current events quite a bit. And uh, whether it's for work or for your interests and you know, or whatever it may be, um, do you see any reality or any set of events like the ones I just laid out that lead to any kind of nuclear weapon use and unfortunately subsequent um, mutually assured destruction to some extent. Mm. So I agree with that statement that that person made where I think that, I mean, we could have a whole episode talking about Ukraine. Sure. <laughs> um, I think I could, I definitely see Russia using a nuclear weapon in some form um, in Ukraine if they are facing a catastrophic military defeat. Um, I don't see Russia losing this war um, in the way that I'm sure Ukraine would like them to win or to lose and how we would like them to lose. Uh, you know, Zelensky has talked about, you know, even recently he's talked about liberating Crimea, that peninsula that Russia annexed in 2014, which is now what Russia views as part of its integral territory. I could see I could see it being, you know, a worst case scenario for the Russians. And again, I'm just spitballing here. I could see it being where Ukraine is able to push them back out of the advances that they've made since February, um, retaking Donetsk and Luhansk, those two separatist regions, uh, and launching an offensive in Crimea. And if the Crimean offensive is not going well for the Russians. I could see them using a nuclear weapon. Um, I would see that... I could see them using a tactical nuclear weapon, which is a smaller scale. You know, it's not like a bomb that you're going to drop on Kiev. Or Kiev, excuse me. That's the Ukrainian pronunciation now. <laughs> um, using a, a tactical nuclear weapon on the battlefield to take out military targets. Um or using something that spreads radiation uh, that makes a certain passageway impassable. Uh, I don't see the Russians using a, a large nuclear weapon to destroy a city, an entire city like Ukraine. I think that that would be a little, um, a little outside the realm of sanity here. Um, I do. I, I mean, I do think that, um, that the Russian leadership are rational actors at this point. Um, and I don't think that that would be a possibility really there. Um, and so I think at that point we would be entering uncharted waters in terms of 
what the military was, response would be um, to that, right? Because no, nobody's used a tactical nuclear weapon before. We haven't used one either. Mm -hmm. um, small scale nuclear explosion or something like that, um, right? It wouldn't be against the United States or a NATO member. And so I don't think, I don't think that right now I don't see the United States responding with its own tactical nuclear weapons or giving them to Ukraine or responding like that. I think that that would put a pretty immediate end to the war if they were to use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, and it would just force everybody to come to the table um, because you're just <laughs> reaching uncharted territory that could spiral and spiral and spiral. But Yeah, I think it's really hard to know. And, and you certainly know more than me because, uh, yes, they're not a NATO member, but they certainly, uh, Ukraine has the support, really extensive support from many NATO countries. And every time I think... Uh, from the beginning of this war, although, I mean, you can turn that table back a lot, but let's just look at the, the most recent, quote, beginning of this war, you know, a year ago or whenever it was, um, that I just think, oh, we're only going to give them financial support, right? And then everyone says, oh, we'll have a couple, couple countries give them financial support. And then the financial support grows, and then, oh, now it's Javelin missiles. Now it's top-tier missile defense systems, right? And... Uh, of course, uh, what is it? Um, section five, or I can't remember. I think it's section, Article five of yeah uh, of NATO, right? That applies to NATO countries. But at a certain point, you seem to be pressing up against a line of this person is not NATO, but we care about this strategic position against Russia so much that we're gonna grandfather you in and help you win at all costs. That's what seems to be happening more and more. Now, what does at all costs actually mean in practice? It doesn't mean dropping a hydrogen bomb on, on Russia, I'm sure. But I don't know. I mean, you, you would know more than me, but it does seem like we are encroaching on potentially problematic territory, uh, not to be conspiratorial, but to be realistic about it. I think that's possible if if Ukraine gets enough support from the world stage to to that its people want a counteroffensive. Well, now Russia's backed into a really interesting position. Yeah, no, I th I think that that's a very valid point. Where there there Ukraine is essentially a NATO member in all but name and responsibility and all that stuff, right? So. I, I would say that Russia is essentially fighting NATO in Ukraine without fighting NATO itself, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, we've given them upwards of $50 billion of military aid and training. Uh, I think, right, Patriot missiles are going to be there soon. I know that like 90 to 100 Ukrainian soldiers are coming to the United States in the next few weeks to receive direct training on that. I had read also today that I think Poland is planning on giving... Um, planning on giving Ukraine leopard tanks, which are built in Germany and their advanced tanks and everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it definitely is like, where, where's the line here? You know, why are we pumping, you know, all of this infrastructure or all of these weapons and money in, into this um, country that's not a part of NATO? Um, and where, where's the break? Where's the line there where, um, where we either wash our hands of it or, um, you know, say, oh, that's too much. I think that that, has, I, that hasn't been defined and that worries me. It's, it's really fascinating. It's actually a really interesting question, really for the grander future of warfare, because we think, you know, we're not sending them manpower. So it's, it's not an, uh, a statement. A dec it's not a declaration of war on a global scale. It's not accepting you as a NATO member. But the future of war is not manpower i mean of course um special units you know special forces units and things uh and and carried out assassinations and things like that may be people for the near or long future but i don't see a world where conscriptions at least in america happens again granted we have already so many volunteers anyways but it's not that you send in so much manpower at least in a lot of cases 21st century warfare is it's cyber warfare, which I'm convinced happens behind the scenes constantly with with how many hacks there are. Um, 
but uh, you know, drone strikes, weaponry, right, to their forces. At a certain point, you can only give so much money, and then say uh, to say, well, we're not involved because we don't have any manpower there. Like, well, there has to be a line where you are involved. But again, that line of involvement. Uh, that line, I think, is only a declaration of war. That's what that ultimate line is, and no one wants to call it that because that's nobody's goal, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a really interesting, really interesting future. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk about Ukraine. I think sometime you might have to. I might have to talk to you again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but okay. So, well, let me just finish with with this thought back on on nuclear energy um as much as i want to be pessimistic because the bad pr i'm not going to let the pr get to me because i'm excited you know it's uh, looking at these nuclear especially fusion uh reactors they are they are large they're these large buildings but i think well how did we get to the moon we had a large building with maybe not as much technology density in it but that's as people say equivalent to what an iphone 4 or something like that um If that's really the case, then I can only imagine that we're going to be able to shrink these down or, if more beneficial, keep them the same size but greatly accelerate their energy productivity. And not just on the the, um, scale of, of total productivity, but we're talking net productivity, right? We put in 1% of the energy that we get out, right? Something like that. It seems like what futurists of decades past would call limitless energy. Do you think, uh, to end on on really uh, your speculative note on your part, do you think that is a real possibility for our future, that we have machinery that, yeah, I'm going to put in X amount of energy and I'm going to get orders of magnitude return, seemingly limitlessly? Yeah, I think... I don't know about limitlessly, but I definitely see uh, in the next decades and probably in the next generations uh, the technology advancing to the point where we will get more energy than we put in uh, by a high order and that we'll be able to harness levels of energy that we've never been able to. Um, Just more energy with fewer resources. uh, And I think that fusion is the key to that. And that's basically the way forward um, to kind of supercharge the next wave of, of human progress and development internationally. So, Well, why don't we ask you one final question then. If you were the lead advisor to the president uh, in, uh, in the energy sector, let's just say if that position exists, the lead energy advisor to President Biden or the next president, whoever that is, what advice do you tell them? I would say just pump money into fusion research and just dump it in there. And just fusion, not the other renewables to the same extent. Um, I would say put most of the money into fusion. Uh, you know, there's tons of private companies that have, you know, kind of taken a lot of the other renewables and clean energies and um, ran with them. And I think that's great. But I think that the real, you know, energy savior, if you will, is is fusion. And that's where um, our government research and funding needs to be prioritized, at least in energy, that we just need to hire scientists and fund laboratories and researchers and everything. So reorganize the budget and maybe divert some funds into into the Department of Energy. <laughs> well, it's easier said than done, but I trust your judgment. <laughs> well, uh Ethan, thank you for talking with me again. Uh, You've become something of a a semi-regular on this podcast because you have your hand deep in so many places, Um, global affairs to to energy to uh, linguistics in some sense. So uh, I'm certainly going to talk to you again at some point, I'm sure. But thank you once again for for sitting down and and educating me a little bit because it's it's hard to find consolidated information uh, about a lot of what we're talking about here. And and news headlines don't always give me the right information. They all have their bias. So um, so thanks for talking with me and, and, and educating me more on hopefully the, the future of our energy in this world. Of course. I had a great time. Thanks for having me on.